So this project, uh, I'm going to put it in the category of where the ACH can help with leverage. And you know, I know Cynthia is going to introduce them, uh, but this is really exciting that I am hoping we see more projects like this one. So thank you. All right, this is another one of our partner highlights. And um, this is Carrie Mata. She is the executive, of, no, I'm sorry, the president and CEO of the Community Foundation of Snohomish County, of which I am a board member. I'm very grateful to be able to introduce them. This is a project that leverages dollars, resources, community voice, and I'm really excited for Carrie to share this with you. Hi everyone, thanks um, for giving us an opportunity to share some of our stories. Um, our 1555 project is awarding uh, 15 BIPOC-led and serving organizations in Snohomish County with $50,000 of unrestricted, like free, do what you want money, every year for five years. And yeah, woohoo! And I have been, my partner, to our, we have three partners here you're gonna hear from in a minute. Our partners asked me to come and speak for 60 to 90 seconds, very specifically about how this project came forward. So start, go, okay. So, and I think the reason they wanted me to speak was because this project was not created by our board. It wasn't created with CEO brilliance on my part. It was actually created because we listened to our community partners. And what we found during the pandemic is as we were working with partners, we were hearing things such as, great, this CARES money is great, it's one-time money, and hey, Community Foundation, what are you doing next? We also heard, hey, Community Foundation, yeah, you're nice enough, but we've been here for 30 years and you have never funded us. Hey, Community Foundation, we actually know the stuff. We know the stuff in our community. We don't need your ideas about the stuff. We just need you to give us money. So we spent a lot of time listening. We spent a lot of time building trusting relationships. And we spent time looking at power structures. Who gets to decide? So in the philanthropy world, we have a saying that says, move money to move power. And our board did that. But the other thing we did is we went out and we leveraged our funding partners. We leveraged our donors and we leveraged our partners. And we went to partners like North Sound ACH and said, hey, these are organizations you also should be funding. You don't get to be the center of this money or this world. You get to come along and be supportive in the ways that they have asked us to be supportive. Do you want to be on this team? Of course, Liz and her team, amazing, as we know. They said yes right away. The other funder that said yes was the Gates Foundation. And that's like a happy surprise for a lot of us who work in this region. No shade. That's a, I'm, I'm going to end it right there. That's all I'm going to say. But Gates is a partner in this work, happily, joyfully, stepping aside at times and stepping, stepping back at times. So with that, I think I might have exceeded 90 seconds. I'm turning it over to Jackie, who is going to kick us off and is going to share um, some partner stories. Yes, thank you. Uh, my name is Jackie Julian. I'm the executive director for Communities of Color Coalition, C3. Uh, pronouns she, her, they, them. I'll save the formal introduction because I learned right before we got up here is what's standing between you all and lunch is us. So <laughs> that being said, um, I also wrote down my notes. You're welcome. Uh, one, I want to just start by, um, I appreciate the introduction, um, and as Carrie Wen mentioned, that this really was from a collection of Building One relationships long before one COVID, and so trust was one established and an active commitment to learn um, to make this work light and easy for us. So in terms of like, you know, the approach, the methodology, there's nothing innovative about one community-driven, uh, community-driven one research and so um, and there's nothing one transformational and or radical about us wanting reprieve from the inherent unjust violent oppressive systems I think it's important to note that this work one is not from a place of well intentions no white saviorism uh, performative efforts it's rather again the years of the consistent 
uh, curious commitment to leverage one year positionality, honoring our emotional labor that we're one force to carry. Uh, our community, our sustainability, our one cohort, and, and our legacy is interdependent on our ability to show up and work along each side and strengthen each other. And that's what one we do with one year support, but also collectively with each other. And so our work is one grounded in the belief that our liberation is interdependent on how we show up for one another by centering one relationships. It's how we tend to each other. It's how we share with one another. We lend, and mostly our willingness to mend with one another. Uh, systems don't, one, maintain themselves. People do. And so like one Carrie said, there is so much one that we continue to experience and these pits that we get stuck into of the extraction of data, data, data. Tell me, it's like the trauma circus. Like tell me, right, your, your sad tragedy story. When we know that we've inherited this corrupt system and it is perfectly flawed to des and designed to one keep us in these spaces of pitfalls. And so our one approach is, again, nothing one radical, but really one that is just a collective commitment to one continue to invest in one each other, in one another. And one, our, our progress is also a direct reflection of the result of the long, deliberate uh, process of our collective dreaming, uh, cultivating and actively listening to the echoes of our ancestors. It's one contradicting the forces and structures that try to silence our generational truths and erase our presence. One, the expectations of grassroots CBOs and like our work, if I could best one describe it, it would be like asking a fish to describe the water. We're not one siloed, we're one forced to work beyond capacity. So then how are we inherently um, allowed, ever allowed to dream if we're never allowed to rest? The funding that one we receive is um, encouraging knowing it, I feel like it's a responsive way because one, we are creating relationship, but it also creates the space to allow us to plan and prepare to avoid those chronic pitfalls, as I mentioned, that are in current systems that never allow us to one, actualize, to mobilize and or visualize and or respond outside of crisis. One example would be state contracts. And if you all are one familiar, it's a reimbursement model. One cannot enter a contract with one money they do not have. And so that being said, like, there's a number of things that the funding does allow us the flexibility to one put in the places and all the plug holes that keep us from falling into those pitfalls. And um, I look forward to continuing this conversation and sharing more, but I'm gonna pass it on to my colleague, Leilani. Well, good morning. It is such a pleasure and a delight to be here. My name is Leilani Miller, and I am the executive director of Millennium Ministries. And I personally have learned a lot. Matika yesterday was amazing, and so I really thank you for having her speak and, uh, and, and encouraging me in what I've been called to do. I I'm uh, gonna present a more personal story about what Community Foundation has done for my ministry and our community. And one of the things that I believe this money was given to us um, as talking with Carrie and Angelique, it was to bring ease to our ministries. A lot of times we receive money that has many stipulations. And so we aren't really allowed to dream. What could we do if we didn't have the stipulations that most of the grant dollars put on us? And so this money was no stipulations. And it truly brought me a a lot of ease. It allowed me to really dream about what was best for our community and what could I do. And one of the things which is in line with what I heard yesterday was standing on our ancestors' shoulders. Well, we know in the black community that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. The ancestors we have had to endure insurmountable str uh, struggles, but they did accomplish great things. And so our dream was, what if we went out and found 100 
African-American women and brought them together and showed them the struggles of our ancestors and helped empower them and encourage them that they could do the same kinds of things. Now, without that money, I would never have been able to do this because what grant, I, well, I couldn't find a grant that would allow me to um, bring in 100 women and treat them and show them and encourage them and help build their confidence so that they could dare to live their dreams. And, um, and, and it's been amazing. It grew from one thing to a whole cohort of 100 women. And these women are going to accomplish great things because there is an uh, organization that allowed us to dream and allowed us to um, affect our community in a way that other grants and other types of money would not allow. And I know that it is going to grow. Um, one of the things that I do like about um, this 5-1550 grant is that it is ongoing for five years. So we can do more. We can encourage more women. We can encourage our community to do and to think outside of the box because we have been given the ability through this grant to think outside of the box as well and see our community grow and um, see our, our the, the idea is to grow the women and the men so that they can grow and encourage the children. And we can get away from some of the generational traumas that we have had in the past. And we can have an equal playing ground and um, equal opportunity to do the things that we dream about as well. So the whole message of the ancestors yesterday and the whole message of uh, uh, prior generations and accomplishing things that prior generations accomplished but never had the, um, the, the, you know, the, what do I want to call it, the um, advantage of allowing everybody else to know, because some of the things Matika told me, I, of course, I didn't know, I had no idea. And so we in the black community, we want you to understand some of the things that we have gone through and some of the things we no longer have to go through because of organizations like ACH and Community Foundation, okay? Thank you. Um, <clears throat> My name is Dr. Gloria Gazaho. I am the president and CEO of the Black Healing Fund. I'm not gonna stand here and talk to you about the Black Healing Fund. I'd like to encourage you to go to our website and actually find out what we do, blackhealingfund.org. But I wanna talk about, uh, and I took some notes, but I'm gonna put this down for a minute. I'm gonna speak from the heart, because I think that usually works out best for me. Um, I just wanna talk about two things. Two of our pillars um, are building stronger partnerships and uh, decolonizing access. And it is refreshing and important to see an organization, a foundation that actually exemplifies that, that does not just put it on paper, but they do it in action. And that is the community foundation. Uh, decolonizing access allows them to be able to say, we trust you, give us money, we didn't have to go through some complicated uh, processes, fill out uh, 100 pages of all kinds of stuff. It was like, we know you need money. We know what you're doing in the community. Here you go, go do it. I don't know about you, but that's a relief, especially for smaller organizations that are really doing the work in the community, don't have a ton of resources. To have people to have to go through crazy hours of applications just to get a little bit of money. And so to have an organization that is willing to say, we're going to decolonize the process and access to actually allow, make it easier for you to do the work is beyond refreshing. And so to me, that's how philanthropy should be. That's the model of philanthropy that we want to start to see. Lessen applications and trust people who are actually doing the work meet them and have conversations with them. The second piece to this is building strong network. What this grant did was basically to tell us that we don't have to operate from a place of scarcity. There's abundance everywhere. It takes a village for us to do this work. We're not the only ones who are providing services. There are many others who are doing the same things. 
what philanthropy has done in the past has said, here's a little bit of money. Come and fight for it. What this grant said is, there's abundance. Here it is. It's available, right? It's a changed mindset. And that allow us, again, to be able to access funding. Not only that, but it also allows us to be able to network with each other, to create more efficiencies and um, be effective in how we deliver services. And you don't see a lot of that. And to the, uh, I'm going to finish with this. This stability that this create, long-term stability that says, we're going to be here along the way for the next five years with you. We're not going to let you down. It's not like we're telling you today and then tomorrow we're going to change it. No. We're here with you and we're going to support you behind, beyond just giving you funding. That's, I don't even know what else to add to that. So thank you uh, to our partners, colleagues, and everybody else. And thank you, everybody else. So there you go. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, partners.